Well, Ross, over the last 25 years, the, the, the fund has completely transformed the cultural life of the United Kingdom by giving, I think, nearly eight billion pounds to our cultural and heritage institutions. And it's the envy of countries all over the world. With this great success, why is there now the need to change the name? Well, as you say, Lloyd, it's, it's 25 years since the fund was set up. In fact, since National Lottery was established. Uh, an amazing idea of, of bringing funding directly into supporting those things, those, the good causes, uh, which otherwise couldn't be funded by government. And as you say, incredible that in the UK, 20% has been given to heritage, which is not the case in many other, other countries. And 25 years on, with so much achieved, it seemed the moment to say, are we doing enough to thank the national lottery players who give us that funding? Do they actually understand that all the things that they go to, the parks they visit, the theatres they visit, uh, you know, when they're going around and enjoying all the things that we funded over the years, do they understand that they're responsible and that they've contributed to that? And, and much of the research we've done says actually they don't. So it seemed the moment to change the name to the National Lottery Heritage Fund and make that connection much, much clearer. So it was more than just a response to the idea that there might be some slight slowing down of ticket sales? Absolutely. I mean, it is important. All the research we do says that people feel more favourably about the National Lottery if they understand that they uh, aren't just funding an opportunity to win. Obviously, they'd love to win. Uh, you know, I play myself. I'd love to win. <laughs> but also that they are contributing to the good causes all around the country. And of course, not, not just heritage, but to sport, to art, to our wonderful Olympic success. So making that linkage more clear uh, is really clear. And indeed, that's the very strong feedback that they, we've had from them, that they really feel that we, we talk to lottery players directly, they feel that people want to know where that money has gone. Does that also mean that institutions that are in receipt of funding are going to be encouraged to be a little more prominent in the thanks they give to the fund? We've always asked organisations that received our funding to say thank you uh, and to make it clear that that's what the source of the funding was. But it hasn't always uh, been that prominent or necessarily promoted that strongly. So I think we will be asking people just to make that connection a bit more, a bit more effectively than perhaps they have in the past. And we've had some brilliant examples of that in the last couple of years. We've run a, uh, a promotion called Thanks to You, which has been about all the people that we funded, or a very large number of them, opening their doors and doing something special for lottery players as a thank you for, for the fact that they buy tickets. So that immediately makes a direct link in people's mind. Those are the sorts of things that we want. And actually it's brilliant because it's a real win-win. It's enabled them to reach an audience that they haven't necessarily been reaching before. So they get new, through, new people through the door and it's enabled us to do something to thank the people who help make it all possible. Now, I, I understand that in 2019, there are not going to be any grants in excess of five million pounds. Um, is that a harbinger of future, <laughs> of, of future grants, or is that just because of the situation this year? It's, it's really interesting when you look at how we use our funding, and there's, a, there's an enormous diversity of opinion out there about whether the important grants are, are the very small community grants, of which we make a very large number, or whether it's actually those really big, iconic investments they make. Think we make things like v &A Dundee, which have absolutely you know, contributed to the transformation of Dundee. And I think the answer is they're both important. So actually, although we've paused large grants for 2019, we will be reinstituting them at least twice during the next five-year framework period. Now, you mentioned v &A Dundee, which is a wonderful project, but a lot of these so-called iconic projects inevitably seem to be in London. And I think many people have thought, well, actually, hang on, is London getting more than its fair share? How do you redress the balance to make sure that adequate investment is going into the regions? 
Well, we've got a pretty robust process because we allocate our funding largely, not entirely, but largely on a per capita basis. So uh, the funding tends to go where people live. Uh, and that means that if you like, all the regions do receive their fair share. When it comes to larger projects, that isn't allocated on a per capita basis. We do try and make sure, however, that we uh, give, uh, you know, wherever the good projects are, that we support the things. And we have a fantastic track record of doing that. A significant proportion of our funding goes outside of London. Uh, it is important that we continue to support London as the capital city. I wouldn't want anybody to get the impression that we wouldn't fund London and we wouldn't fund fantastic projects in London. And of course, one of the reasons why you will see uh, investment going into London is because we do have quite a large uh, gathering of fantastic institutions in London. But we have, over the years, really worked hard to make sure that our funding is pushed out across the country. We've delegated decision making to ensure that those decisions are made locally. And I think that's been incredibly effective. Presumably, one of the most difficult things about your job is balancing all these competing demands, namely London versus the regions, big projects versus small projects, et cetera, et cetera. How do you, how do you make sure that things are fairly distributed when so many of the organizations within the heritage sector are almost run by volunteers or part-timers and don't quite have the resources to put into application forms? How are you gonna help them get a fairer crack? I think the heritage sector is characterised by the fact that it, it, it does run from very big, very impressive institutions that have been going for a very long time, some of the major museums, the National Museums, for example, right through to tiny little organisations which have come together maybe even just to deliver something particular in their local area. Uh, we recently funded a lot of projects around the First World War and there was a lot of things where people came together specifically to deliver a project. I think one of the things that we're really expert at is making sure that we tailor the offering that we've got to the people we talk to. And our grant programmes range from £3,000 right up to uh, over £5 million. So within that range, our expectations obviously range as well. Uh, we don't expect a tiny little project which is being delivered by volunteers to deliver the same level of outcomes or to have the same level of, of sort of governance and structure around it as we would a major capital project like v Dundee. The major capital projects seem to attract the most attention, which I guess is inevitable. And a lot of those seem to be around museums. Yet there is a shift, isn't there, in the sort of projects you're, you're backing. Is, is, is more effort going to be put into supporting the natural landscape, for example, or public access projects? Where is it, where's it going in terms of your funding intentions? Yeah, uh, I mean, we will continue to fund the full range of heritage. So we will continue to fund museums, we will continue to fund churches, we'll continue to fund all of the things that we've been funding over the years. There is no doubt that the feedback that we have had, interestingly, fairly consistently, uh, in the extensive consultations that we've done over the last couple of years, says that natural heritage is incredibly important to the people of this country. And the work that we've done in supporting species and supporting access to the local countryside, in helping to bring parks back into use, is definitely enormously popular. So we will be focusing on that and trying to ensure that the natural heritage continues to get significant support from us. Equally, the, the, sort of the other area that is very important to people is community heritage, local heritage. I think it resonates very closely with people. So again, that will be an important area of focus for us. But to emphasise, that doesn't mean we won't continue to support the other types of heritage. At the end of the day, we can't fund everything we'd like to. We have far more excellent projects coming to us than we can afford to fund. And, and that's a sad fact but it is where we are. So we do have to make decisions. We do have to make judgments. Uh, our committees and our boards have to make difficult judgments every time that they meet. But we work very hard and we allocate our funding very carefully to ensure that we do fund that full breadth of heritage. 
Returning to the fact that so many heritage organizations are very small and are driven by volunteers, do you have any plans to put more funding into capacity building? We do. Uh, one of the uh, things that sort of come out really clearly is, is that the, the cap, if you like, on, on there being more ability to rescue and restore and bring back into use heritage around the country isn't people's ambition or people's passion for it. It's actually their capacity to deliver it. So one of the things that we want to do is to really strengthen the ability of, of, of these groups to take on a project. Uh, and so that will be a real focus for us, capacity development. And within that, one of the things that we want to do is to strengthen the way in which all of the organisations we work with use digital as a tool for making both their own organisations more effective, but actually what they deliver more effective as well. The fundraising climate has become much, much more competitive than it was even five or ten years ago. Given the fact that this makes match funding much more difficult than it used to be, how does that influence the way you give out your grants? Uh, I mean, we recognise that organisations sometimes struggle to get match funding and again we set our expectations in terms of, of match funding taking into account uh, the area where they are, their ability to attract funding, the size of the organisation, the type of project that it is. But we do ask people to try and bring other funding in, not just because it helps to enable our funding to go further, but actually because it helps to engage more people, it helps to involve more people. If they've been able to go out and raise funding, even if it's a relatively modest amount, by going out and campaigning at a local level, far more people know about that project. So it's really important to us that, that they use funding, fundraising as a tool for engagement. Do you think, given the, uh, the generosity and the success of the fund over the last 25 years, do you think that might have encouraged the heritage sector to become a little too dependent on the fund? <laughs> I mean, we are without doubt, um, you know, probably the largest funder in heritage, certainly the largest funder outside of government. And so, uh, you know, there is a tendency for organisations to think about uh, will uh, the lottery, will, will the fund fund that project for me? Um, and what we have always encouraged organisations to do is to think about what it is they want to do rather than think about whether it's something we would want to fund because it's really important that they start with a project that is a project that's close to their heart and delivers what the community, whatever that community might be, wants to see. So I think there has been um, a tendency perhaps to, to focus on our funding. One of the things that we're going to be doing in the new framework is extending the use of our funding more by using it more creatively. So we will be looking at loans as well as grants. We think that's important because it doesn't just enable the funding to go further. It, it sort of encourages organisations to think very robustly about their business plans and about the sustainability of the project that they're taking forward. We're also looking at ways in which we can work in partnership with other funders to bring money into heritage. There's no shortage of demand for funding, uh, but clearly there's a limit to what we can fund and other sources of funding, local authority funding, for example, is getting much more difficult because of, of the pressures that they're under. So uh, what we do want to do is to see if there's ways in which we can attract more organisations to come in and fund heritage where it's relevant to what they're trying to achieve as well as being, and, and by working together, we think we can do that. What would you like to do to the heritage that you haven't yet so far? What are, what are the bits of heritage that you haven't yet reached successfully, do you think? I doubt whether there's any sort of heritage that we haven't reached in some shape or form. One of the very clever things that was done when the, uh, the lottery for heritage was first set up, when, when we, this fund was first established, was a decision was made not to define heritage. 
That, I think, was a very far-sighted decision because it means we've never had to redefine heritage. And I've got no doubt in my mind that we are funding things now, 25 years after National Lottery was set up, that wouldn't have been considered heritage at the time that the lottery first happened. So it it's moves with the time. It means we haven't had to, to redefine or to think about, is that old enough? Is that important enough? People come to us and they tell us why something is part of their heritage. And they come to us and they tell us why it's important to them. And I think that ability to respond to what's going on within the community, within the UK, to what people see as being really important and heritage from their perspective is something that we will always continue to do. So I understand that the English regions are going to be restructured. Oh, why and what beneficial effect will that have? Yes. Uh, the fund is one of the few organisations left that's still structured around the old English regions. So we have nine at the moment and we're moving to three. And the reason for that is because it enables us to provide much more flexible funding. It enables us to work more strategically uh, with things like the Northern Powerhouse, for example. So it enables us to align ourselves with uh, parts of the country uh, and to be able to have really strong conversations about what the priorities are within that particular area of the country. So we see it as, as a way of um, bringing the resources much closer to where the decision making is being made. And in fact, to, in, to sort of strengthen that, we are delegating more significantly the decision making from the board to these new committees. So all decisions up to £5 million will be now be made by the area committees and indeed by the existing country committees in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. What are the positive things that the fund can do to help areas that are economically deprived? We've worked for a long time to try and ensure that our funding reaches as many parts of the country as possible. And sometimes we're incredibly successful. The First World War programme that we've just completed uh, reached 95% of local authority areas. So we have a very good track record of being able to get our funding out to a very wide range in the community. Having said that, we still know that there are some communities and some areas that don't do as well as attra at attracting funding and which are deprived, which, which struggle economically. So what we're going to do is put additional resource. We've identified 13 areas around the country where we're going to put additional resource and additional focus to try and ensure that we enable those parts of the country to be as successful in securing funding for big projects as other parts of the country. Rolls Coast Lake, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Lloyd. It's been great talking to you.